The trade deadline is right around the corner, 15 days to go, in fact, until, you know, the deadline hits. And for the Pittsburgh Penguins, still haven't done anything yet, but I have a special guest joining the show today to touch on everything Penguins related when it comes to the trade deadline. And yes, we will do a small preview at the end when it comes to that massive game against the Islanders on Friday and then that huge game against the Devils on Saturday. But a lot of this episode is going to be trade centric. So hope you all already get your you know, trade proposals out. Go to Cap Friendly, sit back, enjoy this one. It's all coming up right after this drop. Your Locked On Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm, of course, your host, Hunter Hodes. You want to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at Eleanor's for Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Joining me now is a very special guest. He has not been on the show for a little bit, but he is from Penguins Twitter. Jeff, aka at Latang Cult on Penn's Twitter to touch on everything trade centric when it comes to this team. Due to some webcam di- uh, difficulties, he will not be on the second half of the restream link for those that watch on YouTube. So it will just be his audio coming through. But you'll still get to see my wonderful, gorgeous face. But um, Jeff, really appreciate you coming on to talk everything Penguins related as the deadline is two weeks away here. Uh, Sure thing. Happy to be here. Yeah. So Jeff, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Obviously you follow the Penguins very religiously. Um, You know, what would you say is their biggest need to come and going into the deadline? Some people say third line center. Some people argue goalie because Tristan Jari is still out and we don't know if he's playing on Friday against the Islanders. He didn't practice today, but it had some scheduled doctor's appointments. Some people will even say a defenseman is their biggest need. But when you look at this team right now on paper and you've been watching every game this season, what do you think is their biggest need? A roll-off dumpster so that they could put the bottom six in it. Um, <laughs> I, I think, again, you know, Brian Dimlin's he's trending up, but I mean, like, to what extent is he going to have a, a complete resuscitation of his playing style? Or, you know, is, is there a ceiling there that wasn't as high as it was before? And I think while you still don't know, you know, if you can capitalize on his recent momentum and, and move him out of the deadline, that's probably what they should do. Will they do that? Probably not. Uh, Jeff Carter, I mean, everybody knows that Jeff Carter is an anchor at this point. You know, I, you talk about players taking a shift off. I, I can't tell you the last time Jeff Carter played a full shift. Um, and so Jeff Carter is a big factor. And so for that reason, I think they need to upgrade at the center position. You know, I think that a lot of the names out there could probably uh, at least elevate the existing wingers, be it Kasperi Kapanen, and Danton Hine and Brock McGinn uh, to some extent, whereas, you know, Jeff Carter is quite literally just dead weight. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way <clears throat> to describe it, Jeff. He's he's not what he once was. He was great when he came over. Ron Hextall nailed that trade. Great for the first half of the, of the last regular season, but right when that extension kicked in, he just basically decided to stop playing. I feel like they need to have a Marion Hosa type situation here where he gets allergic to his gear, which then forces his retirement. I mean, he's probably not going to get moved or even scratched. He's probably going to be moved to wing if they do get a third line setter. And, you know, there are some options out there when it comes to centers. Um, you know, I've, I've discussed at length on this show, Max Domi, Ryan O'Reilly, Adam Henrique, Nick Schmaltz, Jonathan Taves, you know, you can even throw in Nick Benino. And that's that's one I haven't really discussed as much as, as much as I've wanted to yet, Jeff. And I wanted to get your thoughts on him. Do you think he would be an upgrade over Carter at this point? Nine goals, 18 points this season. You know, old friend, of course, helped him win two cups in 2016-17, but you know, he's a lot older at this point. You can probably get him a lot cheaper. What do you think of potential, you know, potentially Nick Benino coming back to the Penguins and you know being their third line center? Do you think he gives that line much more offensive oomph than Carter would? Sure, if uh, Timo Meyer's coming with him, but uh, <laughs> outside of that, I you know I don't know that I have that much faith in a 34 year old Benino. Again, um, part of the the reason that he was able to do his magic on the famed HBK line was because of the K on that line. 
a lot of teams, I'm sure the defenses were uh, dialed in on Phil Kessel and what he was doing, and uh, Carl Haglin had speed to burn, and so it kind of allowed uh, Benito to be more creative in that situation. And and so, again, Benito was much younger then. I don't know at 34 years of age, especially with the hard-nosed uh, play style that he has, uh, what he would have to offer the Penguins. If he comes cheap enough, certainly, but um, – you know, you might want to look into acquiring a winger capable of putting a couple uh, pucks in the net because Benino is not exactly lighting the lamp uh, as far as some of these center candidates would be. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And honestly, <clears throat> I don't think you can probably get him for that. Well, I do. Th well, I think I screwed that up. I do think you can get him for relatively cheap. I don't think the Sharks are going to ask for a second or a third round pick, anything like that. I think maybe a fourth would probably do it. You know, he's again had okay numbers this year, but you know, as you said, he's a lot older at this at this stage, and he's not nearly as good as he used to be. So <clears throat> would make sense, but again, I don't know if he provides enough offense. Someone who I do think would make a lot of sense, and Jeff, I touched on this earlier this week. I wanted to hear your thoughts on this here. <clears throat> Excuse me, is Ryan O'Reilly? You know. In his 30s, yes, but finished fourth in the Selkie voting last season. Has put up great offensive numbers again this season. Yeah, he's probably maybe leaning towards staying in St. Louis just because he's been there for so long. But um, in terms of a natural third-line center, Jeff, that is a slam dunk for me. All of his underlines are great. Contract, you can probably make it work. I don't want to hear anything about the cap. I mean, the Rangers didn't have that much space when they were taking on Vladimir Tarasenko's massive contract, and the Blues still ate half of it. So. I'm sure the Penguins could make that work. Um, do you think O'Reilly is probably the best fit third line center wise? Yeah, I think he might be what they need. I mean, like you got to also uh, consider again, the team's defense is, is a little bit suspect right now. What really concerns me about that is one of the key players in why our defense wasn't that great. Uh, Jan Ruta, you know, he just didn't bring much to the table and now he's been out Dumoulin's playing a little bit better. And so where where are these defensive breakdowns happening? Is it a systemic thing? Is it, you know, the the centers and the uh, the forwards aren't, you know, doing their part. And so the defense is trying to overcompensate. So whichever guy the Penguins bring in, it, he's got to be of a unique skill set that he brings some scoring to the table, but also is solid defensively. If they could find a, a third line center in somewhat of the Zucker mold where, you know, it's a very solid, well-rounded 200 foot player. I believe that's going to benefit them the most. Um, O'Reilly fits that bill. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned Boone Jenner before. I think it would take a lot to pry him out of uh, Columbus. Um I mean, there's a number of options they could choose. But it, I, again, and I think that's probably the reason they haven't made this move yet is because uh, the Penguins are doing their due diligence in, in finding the right fit. I mean, if you look at what Carter brought to the table when Hextall acquired him, as you said, it was great. Carter uh, came and, and, I mean, essentially shocked everybody with a revival of his uh, career for that, what, half a year? Mm -hmm. um, and... I mean, if you look at how naturally uh, Ricard Raquel fit, I mean, it takes a heck of a player to bump Brian Rust off of Sidney Crosby's line. And Ricard Raquel was exactly what the doctor ordered. So in that regard, I have trust for what Ron Hextall is going to do because he's shown a an excellent eye in midseason for what piece the Penguins need. And I think a lot of fans are frustrated about, you know, that it's taking so long, myself included. I mean, it, this team has been middling for so, so long this season, and Heck still hasn't made a single move. I mean, now there's the uh, Metro arms race going on. Penguins fans are used to a lot of transactions happening. Nothing's really going on in the Penguins front right now. In fact, I haven't even seen scouts out for the Penguins in the last couple of days. Last week, a couple of the Blackhawks games, there were two Penguin scouts and essentially nothing since. And so maybe they've dialed in on somebody, whether that be Taves, Domi, uh, even, you know, we saw the, them connected to Jake McCabe. And so whoever it is, you know, I, I think Hextall is waiting for the right move rather than, you know, just going out and getting a guy because he's a third line center. Does O'Reilly fit that bill? Sure. But uh, I think it's more about the right guy rather than just whatever you can find. And that's like very anti Jim Rutherford in a way, because, you know, Rutherford would always just, you know, he was had some decent trades, but a lot of times he would also just throw something at the wall, hope it sticks. And, you know, 
Ron Hextall is the complete opposite trade. of that. <laughs> He's probably one of the most passive GMs I've ever seen. And that is also the saving grace that I have, Jeff. You know, he has nailed the past two deadlines. Carter deal, very solid. Ricardo Kell didn't really give up much in futures, gave up a couple bottom six forwards. You got a top six, top line forward in return for really not that much. You didn't even give up your first round pick. So that is a little bit of my saving grace going into this deadline. Real quick, before we do head to a commercial here, you brought up Max Domi from the Chicago Blackhawks, another option there. I did read in Elliot Freeman's 32 thoughts that it sounds like he might want to stay with the Blackhawks. Sounds like he's liking it there. I'm not really sure how much to believe that because I'm sure, you know, contenders are going to want him. You know, do you do you think, you know, he makes sense as maybe a cheaper option compared to O'Reilly if the Blues ask for too much in return if the Penguins want to go down that road? Oh, I think Domi would be a brilliant option, even though he doesn't bring so much of the defensive aspect to the team. You know, if you get, I don't know how many moves Ron Hextall is planning on making, but if you have wingers that are a little more defensively responsible or if you utilize Domi in the right place, I mean, uh, Domi's scoring is probably among the best among all of the trade deadline uh, rumored to be available centers. And yet he comes at one of the lower cap hits. And it's thought that, you know, you're not going to need uh, to spend much to acquire his services. Um, just a couple of years ago uh, with Columbus, he, I mean, his, his statistics were amazing. And I mean, uh, he's only 27 years old. He's not ancient. I think he could be a really good piece for the team if they acquired him. Um, defensively, yeah, there's a little bit to be desired. But here's a guy that um, as of the time that I made my chart here, he had 14 goals, 21 assists, 35 points, $3 million cap it. I mean, if you acquire Ryan O'Reilly at half of his cap it, it's going to be more than that. So, I mean, Domi is kind of a guy that I've got penciled in, but I'm sure a lot of teams do. No, I definitely agree with that. And, you know, I think it also comes down to Domi with the asking price. I probably – wouldn't give up my first for him because I don't know if he's worth that no. second in something else. And maybe another thing I would potentially be down for that. You know, if it's a second plus a prospect plus a roster player, or second plus a roster player to make the money work for the penguins perspective, just because they really have no cap space right now. I would definitely be down to do that, but I just can't see Hextall really trading his first for uh Domi. I think he would maybe do it for someone like O'Reilly or someone even better than that. But um, he also does make sense too. Um, that does it for this first segment. Coming up in a second segment, we're going to go into some other targets that are out there, including a top defensive option that Jeff actually really had circle just a week or two ago, and I'm going to get his, his thoughts on that. He's out of the lineup this week, so that's your only hint when it comes to that. But before we get into all that, midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports film. Because new customers, when you download it, you all get a no-sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets back if your first bet does not win just download the app right now it's safe secure and super easy to use and then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and the restrained plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay so don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that is FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA, and locked on. All right, we're back here in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm Hunter Hodes. That is Jeff um, at Latin Colt from Penguins Twitter. So, <clears throat> Jeff, you kind of, I wouldn't say you caused a frenzy on Penn's Twitter about a week or two ago, but you put out a very, you know, I, I should say, it, intriguing, fascinating. One of those two words work when you thought when you said the Penguins should trade for Jacob Trickrin. And you know, the Penguins really haven't been in on those talks. For most of the reports that I've seen, it looks like the Kings have really been serious about it. Elliot Freeman, I think it said the Oilers have been there, the Bruins have been there. But you know, you made a pretty curious case as to why the Penguins should do it. I'm gonna let you expand on that right now. Why do you think the Penguins should enter um that race? Well, the Coyotes have cap space to burn, and I really think that's exactly where the Penguins need to look uh, in terms of what they should be acquiring. And if we're thinking about who the Coyotes are, you know, they've taken on the contracts of Derek Stefan. They've taken upon, uh, I think they they still are eating Marion Hosa's contract, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they, they love these old guys at the end of their careers that, you know, they could still offer something to a NHL team. But, uh, you know, they're kind of done. And so 
that got me thinking. Okay, the Penguins have a cap issue. They need to resolve the cap issue. They'd be willing to burn a first-round pick for a player with term. Hextall's not going to use the first to dump salary, and the Coyotes want like three or four good assets for uh, Chikrin. And here's what got me thinking, because David Pagnota had the uh, teams reportedly linked to Chikrin, and Pittsburgh was one of them. And so if we're going to use, we being the Pittsburgh Penguins, are going to use the first round pick on a player. It's got to be a player with turn, okay? And if you're going to replace, um, for example, a, a defenseman, you know, okay, so Brian Dumlin, I, I, you know, he's at the end of his career, he's expiring on a contract, and, you know, he's not the player that he used to be, right? He doesn't offer what he used to offer. And so it would be most prudent to move. Again, as we said earlier on, it, Probably won't happen because, you know, he is a legacy Pittsburgh Penguin, won cups with the Penguins. But a, a prudent general manager would recognize that the time has come. And, you know, even another team might be interested in saying to the Arizona Coyotes, hey, what do you want for Brian Dumlin? Because they might think that he still has a little bit left in the tank. So with that in mind, you know, they definitely want a first round pick to start the conversation with Chikrin. Sure. They want, uh, you know, a couple of younger players. If you offer them either one of uh, Pierre Olivier Joseph back or uh, Ty Smith, again, those are two um, very young, very uh, high pedigree defensemen that we could offer. And again, that opens the position for Chikrin and still keeps the other uh, in the Penguins lineup. And, uh, you know, a prospect, whether it be um, Sam Poland, whether it be Valtteri Pustinen, uh, Alex Nylander, or even if they're willing to take on Kasperi Kapanen as a like a young project player that could be flippable, uh, it's similar to the mold of what Chicago has done with Andreas Athanasiu Ath- and Max Domi. Um, now, again, that, that has me intrigued because it does make sense from a standpoint of, Okay, Arizona likes to take on these players with this kind of um, with this kind of like okay, Dumlin's on the expiring contract. He's older. They've done that before. That's not new to them. It opens up cap space for the Penguins, and it lands the Penguins a very young, very highly talented defenseman that would allow minutes to be easier for Tang and Petrie, who are getting up in age. And also, is you know, if you're giving up the first, I mean, granted that Chikrin is what 24, 25. He's still young enough that, you know, the next generation after Crosby has gone, he's still going to be pretty good. And even if you flip him at that point, you're still going to get something for him as he's an excellent player. Now, can the Penguins outbid the likes of the Kings or the Bruins? I don't think so. Um, You know, I I think that that they have a lot more to offer. And especially if Chikrin is their number one target, they could afford to go all in on Chikrin. And he'd be a huge difference maker for them as he would for the Penguins. But it might, you know, push them from, you know, contender to cup favorite. Um, and that said, you know, I, I, I can't stop thinking about the notion of it because, you know, I, I take what David Pagnota says to heart as he was the only one last year who ahead of the trade deadline had Ricard Raquel connected to the Penguins. Nobody had ever connected the two of those. And then Raquel ended up going to the Penguins. So even though the, you know, whatever's going on between Los Angeles and Arizona right now, where Chikrin is not materializing, I wouldn't, I mean, you can't, you simply can't roll out uh, Ron Hextall stepping in and saying, Hey, look, if you can't make that work with Los Angeles or Boston, you know, we might be able to do some business. Yeah. And and a lot of these deals got me thinking as well. When I saw the Vladimir Tarasenko deal and the Rangers have him on their top line now, and I know different position, but it's still kind of almost the same thing. Well, one's rental, but one's not, you know, a lot of these bad teams, they, they take futures and they take some bad players. Like for example, Tarasenko, you know, the Rangers sent back two picks, a mad prospect who's in the ECHL and Sammy Blay, who was barely getting any time. And that's for a top line winger. And right. a deal like this with the Coyotes, you know, sure you're going to have to probably give up a little bit more, but I don't think the return is maybe going to be as big as some people think it's going to be. As you said, he is young. He's cost controlled. I think he's making 4.6 for the next couple seasons. If, if I'm, if I looked at my cap friendly, right. Um, that's a wonderful deal for a number one defender on probably at least two thirds of the NHL teams. Um, so it, it makes sense for that because, you know, Dumoulin's walking, especially after this season, we can trade one of the, one of the two defensemen in the system, you know, maybe Jan Ruda gets moved during the off season. Cause you know, maybe he's expendable. Um, it does make sense 
for a lot of those reasons. But again, as you said, Jeff, you know, I don't know if they can even outbid the Kings because the Kings won't even include, um, I think, the number eight overall pick from the 2021 NHL draft because they really believe in him. And they also won't even include Quentin Byfield, who is probably better than most players in the Penguin system, but he also is playing regular minutes now. But um, that's definitely something that would be a lot of fun. It would be very unlikely, just like it looked like Ricard Raquel was, because you're right. You know, I don't think anyone had them connected to Raquel last year except David Pagnotta. Um, so maybe he is onto something here. That would be very awesome. Very Ron Hextall like to kind of sweep in from the shadows. Um, overall, though, do you see the need for adding a defenseman um as big as a forward or a goalie? Or either way, do you think do you, you know? I guess I, I could rephrase this. Do you think as is the defense is good enough heading into really the home stretch of the season and potentially into the playoffs? Ah, uh, I mean, the Penguins still give up a ton of shots. I mean, they, their their defensemen seem to all. I mean, when you see Jay Fresh's player cards or Andy and Rona's player cards, they, they all seem to be painting a rosy picture. Granted, you know, Dumlin uh, has not been fantastic uh, by any means, but yeah, I mean, there's always room for improvement. And uh, to harken back to what Jim Rutherford used to say, you know, if it makes sense to make our team better, you know, I will look into it. And so Ron Hextall absolutely has to have that attitude. You know, everybody has pointed out that he went all in in the summertime, you know, basically saying, hey, we're going to still contend for Stanley Cups. We're re-signing everybody, bringing the band back together. And so, you know, I think the trade deadline has to back that up. You know, it's I, I really think it's going to be fun regardless to see how Ron Hextall responds to a Metro Division arms race with the Sidney Crosby uh, Penguins. That's going to be very intriguing because Carolina and New Jersey, they're all, they're all over Timo Meyer. And if I were on Hexel, I'd be all over him too because he is a player like this does not become available very often. You, you, you know that too. He's has over 30 goals a season, well over a point per game. He is very close to being, I think, a superstar in this league. And the Sharks are going to get a good package in, back for him. But, you know, why, why not the Penguins? He would, you know, make them better. The top six would be even more loaded and it would sign someone like, I don't know, Brian Russ down to the third line, Jason Zucker down there. Um, it would make a lot of sense um, if you ask me. And, you know, speaking of those defensive numbers, Jeff, just go back to what you were saying when they give up a lot of shots. Yeah, since January 1st, they, this team has played 17 games. Their expected goals against per 60 minutes is 30th in the league at 2.98. Their scoring chances against are 22nd in the league. High danger scoring chances against 30th in the league with 15. Um, it's their defensive play has gotten way worse over uh, ever since the new year hit. Um, and, you know, Jake McCabe is out there. Jacob Trickin, as you already said, I wouldn't go over after Gabrikov because I think that's just going to be a total Ben Sherratt like move for whoever gets him. Um, remember last year where the Panthers traded for him and they gave up way too much. I understand they were going all in, but that was ridiculous, but I can understand why people would want a defenseman on there. Yeah. Um, I think, Dmitry Kulikov has been thrown out there <clears throat> as well, Jeff. I think by Pagnotta and I think Elliot Freeman put him on there in his 32 thoughts. Do you think that makes any sense for the Penguins to go after him? Yeah, as we're just spitballing here, because in my opinion, I see him as just a left handed version of Jan Ruda. I mean, would it depends on what you're paying uh, for him and, and what it gets you. If it nets you any additional cap space, I think it could make sense, especially if you're willing to move uh, Brian Dumoulin out in exchange for him. Maybe, again, the, uh, you know, Anaheim sees something in uh, Brian Dumoulin that the Penguins, you know, I don't know, the, the Penguins think he's cooked or whatever. But again, I think all this hinges on on Brian Dumoulin with Jan Ruda on LTIR. He looks poised to come back, but um, that has not happened yet. And so I, I know that uh, a couple of people have connected Jan Ruda to, hey, you know, here's a player that is we like him, but he's expendable. And so if Jan Ruda is not the trade chip, uh, would the Penguins circle back to Dumoulin? And, you know, Kulikov, while not you know, Jacob Chikrin or Jake McKay by any means, if he saves you some cap space and he doesn't play terribly, why not? Yeah. I think it would all have to just have to depend on what's going back again. You know, he's, you know, I feel like the Penguins have a decent amount of defensemen uh, like him right now, but you know, as you said, 
why not? So, you know, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think he probably goes somewhere else, but you know, it's, it's always cool to think about that's for sure. Um, that wraps up this second segment coming up in the final segment. We're going to get Jeff's thoughts on who he would have available. Um, Penguins related in terms of going back to teams. We'll also get into if he thinks, um, a team needs to trade for a goaltender with Tristan Jari still out. Maybe he returns tomorrow. Who knows with Casey DeSmith's in consistent play. And finally, we're going to preview that game against the Islanders as this is a massive stretch coming up for the Penguins. Stick around for that coming up after this commercial break. All right, we're back in this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. I'm, of course, Hunter Hodes. I have Jeff Atlas Hank Colt from Penguins Twitter here to help me. So, Jeff, if you were running the Penguins and you were Ron Hextall, um, deadlines in two weeks, obviously, you know, he traded a couple of roster players off in the Ricard Raquel trade last year, Zach Aston Reese, Tom Mode. Um, who would you have available, um, in terms of returns to other teams for some of these players that we have discussed? Oh goodness. Um, well, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. First thing I would be thinking of is cap space because, I think with this log jam of, okay, right now, everybody's kind of waiting on what's the next move. Is it going to be Chikorin? Is it going to be Besser? Is it going to be um, Meyer? Who's it going to be? And as we're waiting, I think what we're going to see is a number of teams, especially the deadline, uh, not necessarily panic, but I think we're going to see prices drop drastically as everybody's pursuing cap space. And so my biggest priority right now, regardless of, of who or what, would have to be clearing some cap. Now, Ideally, moving Casperi Kapanen out would be great. Um, you know, he he makes a very uh, bloated what three point five million dollars a year. Uh, to three point two, yeah, basically three point two five to um, basically skate around the ice really quickly and not <laughs> offer much else. Uh, Brock McGinn, he he doesn't make a or he doesn't have to carry a huge cap hit, but I mean, opening up that two million dollars would be pretty significant. Um, mm-hmm. Jeff Carter takes up you know three point two five as well and he's kind of again just he exists um josh archibald ryan paling they don't bother me so much i wouldn't try to trade ryan paling uh, teddy bluger or bluger is a name that's been out there lately and it, i guess that um teams you know are more interested from what i'm reading in teddy bluger services but i can't imagine he's going to bring back a huge return you don't need a huge return you just need the cap space so if you could trade him somewhere to a team that has cap uh, Chicago, Arizona, somewhere to that effect. And even if they flip him, you know, that still benefits you and puts you in a position. I, I'm, I think of the Carolina Hurricanes this summer when um, Max Pacioretty became available and the Vegas Knights basically had to trade him for nothing, right? Yep. And so if I were Ron Hextel, I would just set myself up for these dropping prices and teams looking to desperately clear cap, be it whoever it is, you know. Uh, you might get somebody like Jacob Verona, dirt cheap, right? Um, that would be a huge asset to the Penguins. So, cap space would be my number one goal. Teddy Bluger is somebody I'd move. Anybody in the bottom six, I would be hard pressed to maybe trade Paling or Archibald because they're both on very fair contracts and bring you know decent value. But um, as far as defensemen go, Jan Ruda, Brian Dumoulin, I would. I would hesitate to trade Pierre Olivier Joseph. I really like his game. That's personal to me, but maybe not the Penguins. Um, and if somebody overwhelmed me for an offer for Ty Smith, I would take that. But I would like to get Ty Smith and Pierre Olivier Joseph both in the NHL lineup because, I mean, those two very, very low cap hits, I mean, would enable a lot of different things, especially when you clear away Brian Dublin and his $4 million. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. I do want to see both of them. And there, if either if neither of them are traded by the deadline and, and during the summer, and Dumoulin walks, I do think you're probably going to see next season in the left side Pedersen, POJ, and probably Ty Smith. I think they, you know, once they signed Ruda, they probably you know they realized like, oh crap, you know, we have too many defensemen um, at this point, and you know they couldn't even also put Ty Smith up because of their salary cap situation. Right. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Teddy Bluger as well, Jeff, because. Danny Shirey of DK Pittsburgh Sports wrote a really great article that came out on Thursday morning where he said, you know, he probably would not be in the camp to re-sign Bluger after the season. That got me thinking, Jeff, as well, you know, why not have him available at the deadline? What has he done this season to warrant being in the lineup on an every, on an every night basis? I had so many people say, oh, yeah, the PK is going to get even better when he comes back. It's gotten worse 
Well, it did for a game or two. What, what was that? Sorry. PK got better for a game or two, but then it just kind of trickled straight downward from there. Yeah. I mean, you're 100% right. I mean, I, Danny even, I think, included um, some of the stats, I think, from uh, hockeyviz.com, which is a very great website. With you know, If you want to subscribe to it, pay the $5 a month. I very much suggest you do. And <clears throat> the PK is better when Bluger is not on the ice. And everyone kept saying, like, oh, yeah, that's what he does best. But, you know, his offensive game is also tanked, has one goal this season, seven assists. Three of those assists were in one game. So you take that game against the Flyers out. He has five points this season. You know, for the fourth line center, like you're probably thinking, okay, not a big deal, but five points. Eric, Eric Fair put up more than five points in 2016 uh, when, when the Penguins won the cup that season. So, um, you know, I'm assuming you would have him out there as trade bait as well, because, you know, I think teams would still value someone like Bluger despite him not being that good offensively this season. And Jeff, you can slide Ryan Paling into that role as fourth line center. And you're probably going to get decent results because before he went down again, he was playing some fine hockey. Oh yeah. So yeah, just, you know, I just can't believe what the heck happened there. Um, moving gears a little bit, um, Jeff. So Tristan Jari still not back yet. He did not practice on Thursday before the team, the team traveled up to Long Island to play the Islanders. His status remains uncertain for this weekend. I'm sure he's probably going to take the morning skate. Mike Sullivan will announce who the starter is right after. Um, do you see goalie as a pressing need going into this deadline? Um, I mean, no, no, I really don't. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, you're going to get your, your share of games that you wish you had a different goalie with Casey D. Smith, but overall, you know, there aren't many backup goalies out there with a better overall save percentage than Casey D. Smith. Um, and at his value, especially, you know, for every game that is a dud that he lays, he lays two that are just, uh, you know, you're, you, you were left thinking, oh my gosh, that's a backup goaltender. And so, um, I wouldn't press for a goalie if you could get, you know, uh, Cam Talbot or something dirt cheap. Why not? But, uh, outside of that, I wouldn't make goalie a priority. Now, Ron Hextall might, but I just don't see it that way. Yeah, I honestly don't know, Jeff, like how many true goalies are going to be available. At the deadline, James Reimer, maybe that could make sense from the Sharks. You, you said Cam Talbot, but I don't really think he's going to get – I think the Senators, if anything, they might add a little bit. I don't think they want to sell because I don't think that's the message they want to send to the fan base, even though they're not going to make the playoffs this season. So <clears throat> I definitely I think the time to maybe make a goalie switch is going to be this summer. I don't know if they're going to be fully committed to signing Jari. DeSmith, I think, still has another year left on his contract, but you know, maybe something happens there. I think if they do decide to make a move at the position, it's probably going to be over the summer. But real quick before I let you go here, outside the trade stuff, massive few games coming up here for this hockey team. They get the Islanders on Friday, Devils Saturday, and then the Islanders come back on Monday. Um, the Penguin, I tweeted this today. Penguins have a real massive opportunity in front of them here to really separate themselves from the Islanders. They're two points up on them right now. You win both of those games and you got four games in hand on them, you're what? Six points up if my math is right, right there. At least six points up. Still got three to four games in hand. You can really almost make it impossible for them to pass you. Um, just how big is this upcoming stretch of games to you? Oh, it's huge. I mean, anytime you were playing against Metro division opponents, I mean, every point is precious and it's not just enough. I think to win these games, they've got to win them in regulation. These are the kind of games that you just can't let slip away from you or let somebody like the Islanders escape with a point or two and then gain, you know, any sort of momentum because then that could come back to bite you again, that wild card. I mean, it could or could not. I mean, we've seen again, the Penguins do really well. Penguins do really poor. Again, they're kind of middling as is. So you've got to take every point you can get. Yeah. Like, and I, I especially agree with the regulation. You you do not want to take these teams into overtime and give them free loser points. It's just, that's not, that's obviously not good for business. The Penguins, they'll want to get the revenge from what happened last time on Long Island. They got blown out by the Islanders five to one, but the Islanders come into this reeling a little bit. <clears throat> they just played three games against the Canadians, Senators, and the Canucks. Six points on the line, they got two of them. They're only on an 87-point pace right now. That would put them well out of the playoff picture. They've played a lot of games. 
Um, <clears throat> they, they kept talking a big game during practice today. They're going to load up their top line with Anders Lee, Bo Horvat, and Matt Barzell. Zach Parise, Brock Nelson, Kyle Palmieri to round out their second line. Penguin killer Josh Bailey's on their third line with Casey Sasekis and Simone Holmstrom. Pelican and Pulak is their top pairing. And then, of course, you know what you're going to get with Ilya Sorokin when he starts one of the best goaltenders in the league. Um, Jeff, real quick, you know, do you have any keys for the Penguins to win a tough one on the road, and especially in a, in a hostile environment here? I think they just need to understand that they're, you know, pound for pound the better team. They really just – they need to say, okay – you know, it doesn't have to be beautiful. We don't have to blow out the Islanders. We just have to get a solid win. Play the solid 60 minutes. Do not let up that first goal because you know that if you're letting up the first goal, Sorokin's going to dial in. You get a goal early on them. Sorokin might be a little shaky. I mean, the, uh, playing a full 60 minutes has been the key all season. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a big one. I mean, I want the special teams to be a bit better. The power play looked horrendous against the Sharks. I know the Sharks have – we have a top five PK in the league, but you know, the zone entries on it are horrendous. That needs to be a lot better with all the talent that they can put out there. The slow starts, you know, as you said, play a full 60 minutes. Slow starts gotta stop. And in that game against the Sharks, they're giving up odd man rushes 15, 20 seconds in, and the Sharks are taking it to them that for a lot of that first period. That can't happen, especially against a team like the Islanders, who, you know, they will make you pay. They 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 load, they have loaded up their top line going into this one. But Horvat's been awesome all year. Matt Barzell's been good. Anders Lee is a Penguins killer at times. You know, they got players on their second line that can produce. I know they're not playing that well right now, but they can still definitely do some damage. So really curious to see how this one does. Get traffic in front of Ilya Sorokin. That is, is one of the main ways to beat him. And they can do all those things, you know, limit the scoring chances, high danger chances against because the trend has not been pretty as of late. They rank in the bottom third of the league in expected goals against, high danger chances against, scoring chances against. All that stuff, um, they can hopefully come out on the winning side of this one. And we'll see if Tristan Jari does play. I'm sure he'll take the morning skate, as I said. Um, and so that'll be big. And I think Ryan Paling and Mark Friedman, they will probably be out for this one. They did not practice. Um, but I think we're out of time for this one, Jeff. But I really appreciate you coming on, talking, you know, full trade deadline stuff with two weeks to go. There's going to be a lot more trade talk um, coming up in the next week of the podcast. But Jeff, in case um, the people do not follow you, on social media, where can they find your um, outstanding Penguins takes during games? Uh, on Twitter at Latang Cult. There you go. So, yeah, he puts out great content during games, um, scours the trade market like it's no one's business, and, you know, just a great follow for everyone out there. So, really appreciate you coming on, Jeff. I'll have another episode for you all tomorrow after the Islanders game. We'll be recapping it, seeing if the Penguins can get those two crucial points. So that's it for this one. Hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday. I'll talk to you all on Friday.